This is Jeanette de Beauvoir. Isn't it odd what things can sometimes inspire us? The first thing that I ever knew about Gabrielle Bussis was her hometown, which is Nantes. And that happens to be just a short distance from my hometown of Angers, both of them in France. So I met her that way and she totally inspired me. And I'm hoping that she's going to inspire you. This is the story of a mystic. It's the story of Jesus and how he touched a certain woman's life and how she's been able to touch hundreds of thousands of lives ever since then. He and I is a collection of journal entries that record the conversations between Jesus and this mystic, a French woman named Gabrielle Bossis. At the start of every year she records, Jesus gave her what she referred to as a keynote or theme to keep in her heart that year. And in a sense, her whole journal can be a keynote for us today. Gabrielle Bussis was born in 1874 into a wealthy family in Nantes, which is a city in the Brittany area of France, right on the coast. She was popular from a young age. She loved playing cards and going to parties. And the people who knew her still talk about her charm, her vivacity, her infectious laughter. Physically described as tall and slender, Gabrielle seems to have been talented as well, sewing, painting, creating sculptures. At the same time though, she turned to the church for spiritual enrichment. She taught catechism in her local parish, encouraged her students to say the rosary, and twice brought groups on visits to Lourdes. She also read and talked about the saints, especially Thérèse of Lisieux. When the First World War broke out, Gabrielle trained as a nurse and eventually was posted to Verdun, the vicious battle an ambulance driver later referred to as the world's slaughterhouse. This is perhaps part of what gave her an appreciation of the simple, ordinary things in life. War helps people cherish what they have. It's a theme she would return to again and again in her journals, simplicity and a love for the everyday world. After the war, Gabrielle returned to Nantes, where she continued to live an active social life, one that included several marriage proposals. As one of her grand nieces later said, according to her, she received a lot of proposals, all of which she refused because she sensed that it wasn't her path. And that's a good thing, because she had a much greater talent for music and for theater than she had for housekeeping, which really wasn't very important to her. When asked about it, Gabrielle herself said, oh, there were one or two perhaps I could have married, perhaps. And there was an Englishman, but that didn't work out. And I cried about it for a whole two hours. During that time, Gabrielle's village priest and spiritual director turned to her with some of his own problems. Look, said Father Olive, I keep trying to find suitable material for teaching, but there's nothing. It's all ridiculous. Write something for me. Gabrielle responded with a play called The Charm, which addressed young people directly with a warning about the charm of big cities that could easily turn to disillusionment and misery. The play urged them instead to recognize the simplicity and joys of village life. It was so popular that Father Olive wanted more. It was time, he said, for Gabrielle to set sail. And set sail she did. Gabrielle began writing, producing, and starring in plays, 13 of them. They were a rousing success, and she ended up becoming internationally famous. The ideas just come to me, she wrote modestly. But Father Olive had probably known from the start exactly where it was that they came from. And then, when she was 62, Gabrielle took a cruise on the luxury steamer Ile de France, heading for Canada, and seemingly out of nowhere, she heard a voice. She immediately knew that it was Jesus speaking to her. That night, Gabrielle began to keep her prayer journal, not so very different from the prayer journals that we write in now. She would continue writing in it up until her death. 
For years after that trip to Canada, she faithfully recorded the date, what she was doing, often adding how she was feeling, and all of the conversation. The result is truly a spiritual treasure, recording not only Gabrielle's own deepening friendship with God, but giving readers since then a sense of taking part in the conversations too. So what are the talks like? Even though God gives Gabrielle a theme for the year, the topics range from the personal to the eternal. Still, if we're to try and narrow them down, what's really obvious is the blossoming of a simple friendship and an amazing clarity about what is important in life. This is a God who cares about the smallest of feelings, of events, of situations, and all the conversations are shot through with that closeness. These are conversations we might have with a loving parent or a close sibling or an intimate friend. One thing that's striking is that Gabrielle, upon hearing the voice, didn't immediately retire from the world. We often think of saints and mystics as being apart from the flow of everyday life, but Gabrielle's journal points to what we might call a sanctification of the ordinary, a sense that the workaday world can be holy. The journal gives a sense that the smallest moments in life are important, that nothing is ever insignificant. That's reflected in the venues in which these conversations take place. Many of them, they happen in churches, as you might imagine, sometimes during Eucharistic adoration, what she calls the holy hour, sometimes right after communion. But so much more of it also is wrapped up in everyday life. The first conversation, after all, took place on a cruise ship while others take place on trains and railway stations and fields and towns and forests. And again, we come back to the sanctification of the ordinary, a blessing as it were on the regular common activities of life. So many of the passages speak not only to Gabrielle's sense of intimacy with God, but to ours as well. This is a journal that's that's accessible to anyone at any stage of their spiritual journey with practical tips for the spirit. Here are just a few examples. In March of 1940, she got this keynote. It's not what you do that matters, but the way you love me while you work. Another keynote said, love your appearance. I gave it to you. In February of 1944, try to see me in every happening, big and little. And another keynote said, I ask you to wake up in the arms of the Father because each one of your mornings is a new creation. And then, along with the sanctification of the ordinary, there is a sanctification of effort the sense that anything can be holy, everything can be holy, as long as it's an offering of love. I was weeding in the garden, starts Gabrielle, and the voice answers her before she takes the thought any further. Instead of thinking that you are working for yourself, why not think that it is for me all day long? My meals, my walks, my garden, my room, my mending. Won't that be more tender? Won't it be balm for you? These are good questions, and how helpful is that for us? Too often our everyday lives feel separated from our spiritual beings. What if we too could think of all of our work as an offering to God, to make of the drudgery and distractions a holy thing? And it's not just the sanctification of the ordinary that can inspire us. Look at her age. Basis is proof positive that God doesn't take any notice of chronological time. She was 40 when she went into nursing, in her 50s when she became a writer and actor, and in her 60s when she began the journal that would eventually inspire people the world over. So consider reading He and I, the story of a close friendship that can inspire us all.